Welcome. My name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awake in the Dream. My friends, I have a guest today. His name is David Hoffmeister. I'm very excited today because we've had a chance to chat for a while before the show, and we've had a marvelous connection on a very deep spirit level. And I'm happy, and I'm happy to be here, and I feel very awake. And I, I set myself up for being quite asleep this week. I crashed in a scenario in my own life that I manifested. and. I just sort of plotted this one. I knew David would come and be in my life and help me feel very awake, and we could explain the simplicity of the real world. And I'm very grateful because I feel very healed. I see a contrast in particular this week as to where I was misinforming myself, so I want to share some of these symbols with you. But before David and I get started, I'd like to read a little bit from Lesson 66 from A Course in Miracles. My happiness and my function are one. Now, my friends, I'm going to scoot down here into what is italicized just to get to the, to the meat of this particular lesson so David and I can start talking about it. Now, listen carefully to what this has to say. God gives me only happiness. He has given my function to me. Therefore, my function must be happiness. One sentence, as you said, David, leads right into the next one. But the punchline is, are we ready to handle my function is only happiness? I think you and I are experiencing that today. I have felt very electric since I met you, and you're a delight. And you share my late husband's name, which I also thought there was no accident, because a lot of, what, of my pain this week was over a death. And now I have a nice David here to share with me and to, to be awake with me and to help our friends talk about the real world. I want you to help us with a definition, a simple definition of what is the real world. What is the real world? Well, it's from what we just read, you know, that happiness we could define. The real world would be happy. Yeah. It would be instead of trying to, um, as we've done so much in the part of our conditioning, of thinking that we can get the right pieces of the puzzle or get things to work out the way that we want them to work out. It's more of a surrender into just a state of happiness where yeah. I, I would also say the word non-judgment really seems to, to come in there because yeah. we've been told by Jesus, judge not lest ye be judged, and that really it's about surrendering our judgments and that, that happiness, peace of mind, non-judgment, that is the state of mind of the real world, and yeah. that it's possible to live in it. In fact, it's very uh, alluring. Yeah, it's very appealing. Yes. And we're there. Yes. The Course in Miracles tells us we're awake and we're home. Yes. There's no journey, there's no place to go. We don't have to do a 20-part series to show people how to wake up. Yes. But today, we're hoping, and I'm hoping you can help me, to tell our friends how to be awake. Yeah. And when you said the real world, can we talk about the basic premise that we are created, we're an extension of love and of God, yes. that we have everything. And I feel like that can't be said enough, that that can go over our heads, we forget that so easily. Yes. We have everything. Yes. We're whole, we're perfect, we're healthy, we're perfect, we're, we're intense energy, we were created by God, we're extensions, and we keep it alive by sharing it. Yes, I mean, that's the premise of, of what our existence is. It, it, we were created as an idea in the mind of God, which me, an idea in the mind of God would have to share the attributes of God. Yeah. You, have, you hear a lot about God as love, but if we are children of God, if we were created in the likeness and image of God, then we must share the attributes. Yeah. You know, eternal, perfect, changeless, yeah. infinite. I mean, these are, these are the attributes. And you know, and also to be practical because, you know, when people go through this world, they say, well, that can sound very high and very lovely and, you know, la, yeah. la, la, and go around and, yeah. you know, they've been say right. <laughs> phrases, you know, uh, kind of uh, connotations of bliss many and so on and so forth. But we're talking about a real experience here and an experience that is extremely simple. And it's only the complexities of the ego that make it seem out of grasp or that, yeah. Something like you, you know, a spiritual attainment that you have to work hard and very hard to attain yeah. the state of enlightenment, whereas what we're looking at is that enlightenment, the real world, is upon us. It's right here in the moment. Yeah. You know, Jesus kept like giving us clues. You know, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand, a hand is very close. <laughs> right you know, there. This, is, this isn't something we're talking about centuries and centuries away. We're talking about a state of mind that is so pristine and so joyful and that it's right here and now. 
And so really our only task is if anything comes up and arises in our mind that's not th that joy. Happy. 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 Then it should be released immediately because mm -hmm. it serves no purpose if we really want to be happy. And it's and a phase of the ego that's that's done a little, done a little detour and yeah, decided a, to have another tiny mad idea that was based yes. on fear. Anything that's not love is just quite simply a wrong-minded perception. You know, that's what's so great about the Course. 1,200 some pages to say basically that, <laughs> to give us the metaphor, like a stepping stone where he's dropped the Course into the, the, our seeming experiences in the world to say, I'm going to give you a ladder and it seems like you're going to go through a journey of climbing like out even though this is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed, you know, mm. that implying that, that once you reach the top of the ladder, the ladder's going to disappear <laughs> and you're going to forget the climb, <laughs> which, you know, makes sense in the sense that if, if God created us perfect, you know, a journey back to God has to be even an illusion, yeah. an illusion of a journey. Exactly. And, and to really come to clarity is really just to, I call it just to see the false as false. Forgiveness isn't, um, you know, still holding on to something that somebody really wronged you, something so really did something, yeah. that, that, or that you really have done something to somebody else. Yeah. But to start to see that maybe my perception of what occurred has been completely mistaken. Yeah. And what true absolution, what true joy comes from letting go of thinking that something terrible has been done wrong and something has to therefore be done yeah. to make right, yeah. when it's really just more of surrender into this state of mind. Yeah. You know, it is so simple, we were saying before the program, mm -hmm. that it is so simple, it's sometimes far hard to find words to explain that a letting go process takes you right into the real world, into yes. your essence of the being that you are. Yes. And I think we can't say enough how crafty and clever the ego is. We were talking about some examples around work and manifesting deaths and all these kinds of things and these wake-up calls that, that you know, that we, we've, the Holy Spirit's been so kind to us to help us get a, a, a bonk on the head every now and then when we get so lost. Yes. I loved your example about the, is it the friend that was an atheist that needed a big one to mm -hmm. start to, to become real, to start to know who he was, that yes. will happen for all of us. Yes. Yeah, everything that occurs in our perceptual experience, whether it's in nighttime dreams or daydreams mm. or um, um, on some hallucinated jug or just what we would call everyday experience, these are all perceptions. And the perceptions are just given meaning by the ego in the sense that, you know, whether it's good, bad, I like this, I don't like that, yeah. all the judgments, yeah. either extremes. Um, I, our friend John Monday, you know, I, I one time was sharing with him the, the idea of forgiving the good. And so we got into the discussion. <laughs> In other words, a lot of times the belief is, if I can just eliminate all the negativity in my life, then I'll be happy and wonderful and joyful. But what we start to see is that judgment is like on a continuum. Yeah. And, and everything in the world of duality has an opposite, the opposite of ugly, beautiful, the opposite of bad, good. And the, uh, to think that you can just lop off one end of the continuum and yeah. be left with the <laughs> other end is really, we're starting to realize what the course is not going to work. Yeah. So even though it's not a popular topic, I've had people sometimes and I say, you want to do a seminar that may not be well attended, just do one <laughs> called Forgive the Good. Because <laughs> what, but what it really comes down to when you follow it in metaphysically is a state of, of detachment where you are, are living in a state of joy that comes from not judging. Not judging. And that means not judging positively or negatively. Yeah. And you know, we have all had those things where we're like subtly fishing for a compliment. Yes. And we can seem to ride out that compliment and feel that the, the energy that comes from being complimented. But then the flip side comes is when somebody says something that we perceive as a criticism, then we just spin. I know. And we're attached to the good. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're attached to that compliment, which is really something to take a look at. Once again, do we need it? Do we not feel whole and full? Yes. So there's no journey. We're perfectly healthy. What about these bodies? How can we help our friends with these bodies that we're in, David? Mm -hmm. I mean... Well, the thing about the body is it's, it's really neutral, but it's the, the most important thing to do is to start to withdraw the investment in it in the sense of endowing it with things. In other words, if we're spirit, then we don't really have 
the need to fix it up or to you know do things with it and so forth and, and really we can allow them the Holy Spirit to interpret the body for us mm -hmm. what does that mean the, the Holy Spirit interprets the body as a communication device you know just That's as right. microphones or telephones or computers and the internet and so forth these are all pretty overtly communication devices the body seems to, within the ego's framework, serve as more than just a communication device. Yeah. The body is the ego's home. Yeah, that's right. The, the, the ego is telling the mind, you've thrown away heaven, you've fallen from grace, you've got to be something, and you've got to have some home, and so it's <laughs> telling the mind, identify with the body. Fix it up, you know, camp out, make it, make it your home, and preserve it, you know, for as long as you can. Keep it going. Because, right, it's because it's like, and even these things about extending the life of the body and everything, you know, you can even get into the... Yeah, the, think the, about that. The metaphysics of that, but, but really, it's like the ego just trying to hope that the mind will continue to camp out. Yeah. So, the, the release from it is just asking, please reinterpret the body as a means for your glory, God. I don't want to endow it with things and, and try to make an idol image that will stand before the glory that, that you are. And what you really end up doing is you end up laying aside your self-concept. Um, the things that, that are valuable in this world, power, fame, money, money. physical pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, we could just go on with just a list of those things. Um, What's the receptacle of all those? You know, a famous mind, if a mind is abstract, <laughs> it doesn't really have an image to be famous. You know, a, a body that has a lot, or a mind that has a lot of money, yeah. you know, you, you can see that all of those yeah. things that I just mentioned yeah. involve the body yeah. and are really part of the self-concept. Mm -hmm. And the immense, unspeakable, just unutterable joy of just laying aside the pursuit of those things yeah. is, is just, wonderful because you just can relax into a state of of oneness or an acceptance of just the living moment yeah. instead of being on the wheel of time and yeah. you know if i just have this amount in my yep. bank account and i just have this much prestige or if i look like this publish this book and you know it's like the hamster you know just yeah. or when will this end yeah. you finally say this is a game i'm not going to play the game anymore i'm going to just relax I'm gonna wake and up. enjoy and wake up. Yeah, yes. it's, 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 it is easy and yet it's easier said than done, but I think what we're trying to do here in this process is to help ourselves be very awake yes. and to make it very simple for ourselves. And being of one mind, David, maybe we can help our friends with the, our oneness, the, one, the concept of this oneness that we all are, because we're all here together, we're all connected. Yes. So any wonderful thoughts and any leaps that you make, we all go with you. Yes. And that's, I'd, I'd love it if we could help our friends with that just a little bit more yes. about that one mind. Well, it's like the, the one mind is there's just peace and contentment. All the mystics and saints have just talked about coming to contentment, just to relax in the moment. And comparison is an ego device, Jesus tells us, you know, for only the, love makes no comparisons. Yeah. So every time, whether we're comparing an image of ourself with trying to improve ourself, or we're looking out at other people and comparing ourselves against someone else, yep. then that is the ego. That's and the ego. It's very stressful because yeah. how good is good enough? Yeah. But if you begin to relax and say, love makes no comparisons, then you can start to get in touch more with just that natural spiritual essence that res resides in each of us yeah. that is there always but it's just been covered over. Yeah, I would love to almost have you say that again. I think people need to, it's always yeah. there. It's always there. It's love is not something that needs to be attained in the future. Yeah. Love is something that just needs to be accepted now. Yeah. And all that means is to clear the mirror of our mind to all the dark thoughts, all yeah. of the, you know, self-depreciating, the self-loathing kind of loathing stuff. thoughts that are that are rolling around. That is is the ego. Yeah. And the message that we're sharing is that that we are not an ego. That yeah. we have a loving, divine creator, and we are an offspring of that creator. And we have everything we need. Yes. And if we let go, it will all come to us. We'll be yes. taken care of. We'll have all those things that the ego says we got to go get. Yes. Yes. We'll be Th happy. Those are blocks to receiving it. Yes. Which is interesting, if we almost turn it upside down and look yes. at everything backwards. Yes. It, it seems, I think that's where we can get into the idea about sacrifice, because I think 
the, the spiritual journey, you know, a lot of times people have images of, of the ascetics and uh, mystics and the, the saints that have gone through um, fasting and walking through the desert and, and basically saying, you know, if that is the way to God, then <laughs> sorry, not for me. And basically what we learn from the Course and what we really teach is that, that it is not a sacrifice to give up nothing. And basically you have to start to, to be convinced by the Holy Spirit that the things of the world are nothing. As long as they seem to be something, and people have come to me and said, well, I still think there's a lot of things in this world that I value, you know, but, and it's going to be hard for me to give it up. And I said, why would you give up something that you still believe was valuable? Yeah. We have to come together and allow the Spirit to convince us that yeah. there is something to take the place of our experiences in the world. Yeah. Why would you give up something that you still believed was serving you? So while there are many seeming pleasures, both psychological and physical in this world, and it seems that way, they seem very real, Yeah. you have to have an experience of a miracle, of, of an intrinsic joy that bubbles up within you to have something that's a contrast to exactly. the pleasures of the world. Yeah. We've all seemed to experience the pleasures of the world in various degrees, yeah. Yeah. and they're fleeting. Yeah. They're temporary. You know, it, and it takes a lot of work to get more. Yeah. We're constantly, I mean, even you, you reach the point in the spiritual journey where like manifesting is a, is a key idea. And I don't want to, to deny that the, that has a place. Yeah. If I believe I'm, I'm a helpless victim and I have no power at all, the idea that my mind is powerful and I can make things happen in my life based on the power of my mind can be a very helpful stepping stone mm. towards me understanding that I am a mind. Yeah. That I was that created got by, it. That I've got it. Yeah. But the step beyond manifesting is really once you've gone through, I call it the magical phase of manifesting, then you have to come to the place of, do I want to be happy? Do I want to be eternally happy and at peace and, and at rest? Or do I want to still con keep trying to construct the dream and have the scenarios and the scripts to come out the way that I want, still implying that I know <laughs> what's in my own best interest? <laughs> yes. And so that's the step beyond manifesting. Yeah. Because, you know, how many you manifest things and money and even relationships and so on and so forth, it, there has to come a point where you sense there's something more yes. and that you're willing to go that extra step. Yeah. Amazing. But the, the trickiness of it, I think, is what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing today, which is needs to be pointed out that the ego is amazingly clever. Yes. Amazing. And we fall for it, but it's yes. okay. We're not supposed to judge that. Yes. We can see what step it takes, and then when we get the wake up, when we have the contrast, it's that letting go and experiencing something better than that. Yes. And that's the wake up. That is what it, being awake is about. Yes. That's being happy. That, that's our function. It was given to us, and we have it. Yes. That's pretty profound. Yes. It's, again, it's extremely simple, but the ego is extremely complicated, and it's very ingenious. Yeah. And I just use those words, complicated and ingenious, as a stepping stone to describe it. You know, also, when you get into this glorious state that I'm, I'm feeling and we're feeling now, <laughs> yeah. the ego is nothing. That's right. <laughs> and, and to describe it as ingenious and, <laughs> and so forth, you know, is to try to, but, but all we're doing when we, when we do that, again, the, these are just symbols, but it's to say that it can't be taken lightly in the sense of, that when you have a negative emotions or um, fear comes up, fear is not to be repressed and stuffed. That's right. That when we talk about really becoming free, it means to look calmly at the ego. And the only way you can look calmly at the ego is to be in your right mind or to be with the Holy Spirit. That's right. To, to look at the ego through the ego yeah. <laughs> is terrifying. Yes. And every time in one's journey when something seems to happen and you start to think, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can handle this, that's just the ego judging what's occurring. That's but the right. movement of healing, the movement to, to wholeness, is, is always occurring. Yeah. And it gets back to, to one of your original things when you were talking about happiness and you were talking about, you know, what is really our function in happiness. It's like I, I came to the realization one time that God's will for me was perfect happiness. And that was very striking kind of realization because I'd heard many things in my life about, you know, well, there was a plane crash, well, God's will, oh. or this oh. happened and this country invaded that country. 
that's God's that's will. Fair. And you have to go into it carefully because what we start to see is God's will for us is perfect happiness and that we have free will in eternity. But as Jesus points out, there is no free will in this world. And so a lot of times people mm -hmm. will associate free will and choice yeah, in that's a synonymous, true. synonymous way. And what we're learning is, is that free will is beyond the dream because it's our state of creation. Yeah. And that the only reflection or slight reverberation mm -hmm. of a free will is the ability to choose. Yeah. So we have to be look at that closely. Choose what? Mm -hmm. What do we have the power to choose? Yeah. Well, it seems like as through the ego's lens of being an autonomous person, it seems like I can choose to do this, I can choose to do this, I can buy this, I can mm -hmm. buy that. What we're learning from the Course is it's, it's much more simpler than that. The choices of the world seem to be endless. Yeah, and they, they do. And they seem to get us nowhere. <laughs> Even when we seem to get good <laughs> at making them with good education, yeah. we have good knowledge behind us, still unhappy. But we get to more of a discernment and the choices between the right mind and the wrong mind. I mean, we're looking at ideas that are radical. Mm. We're being taught that sickness is a decision. Well, if sickness is a decision, then I want to be informed about my decision-making process yeah. in my mind. Yeah. I've had people that say to me, uh, one part of my mind is happy about hearing this idea that sickness is a decision. It's empowering because I feel like I'm not at the mercy of all these forces and germs and earthquakes and tornadoes and plagues. Yeah. On the other hand, I don't know about the responsibility that comes with that. And, and yeah. we have to get into level confusion with that too because the idea that, uh, you know, I don't know if I like the idea that, that I'm doing this to myself. Yeah. And what I, they basically will say to me, David, who in their right mind would choose to be sick? Yeah. And what I say to them is, you've got it. Who in their right, right mind, mind would choose to be sick? Yeah. That obviously sickness is a wrong-minded decision. That's right. And that uh, the next step for me is always teach me. Teach me more about discernment. Teach me more about the discernment between the right mind and the wrong mind. Yeah. Because if I'm still attracted to it, the wrong mind in any way, then that would, that's where the choice yeah. would come in. And we want peace. Yes. And we want to be in the real world. And yes. the real world, it seems the more I hear you talk, it just it gets simpler. I mean, it's, it's beyond words. Yes. It's an experience yes. of letting go totally and going for who you really are. We have about two minutes to go, David, okay. so I wanted to see if we can <laughs> okay. sort of pull this together. Yes, you can, it, the real world is, is highly energetic. Mm. You know, it's, if you can imagine being happy and then you can kind of just imagine extending that happiness it it goes beyond the ups and downs of the world that seem to be just the, the way of the world yeah. and it takes first a lot of um, willingness to even open your mind to the idea that there is a high constant state beyond, constant. Yeah. beyond this world and then to, to let go into and it. And it's yours. Yes. It's yours for the asking. It's yours for the asking. Yes. Yeah, and we didn't get very far out of that garden. And the Holy Spirit is with us. And when we do get lost, it's wonderful to know that we have this wonderful oneness. We have this company. Yes. We can get, we can release and say, I can't, I'm, I'm getting nowhere with what my ego is thinking of. And yes. I defer to better judgment. Yes. God always has the best idea. We still have a couple of minutes. Yes. Now, when we think about getting well and journeys and recovery and the idea of time in any way, like a series of something, or a journey getting home, or the path to wholeness, that example about the, your friend that got immediately very well and the mm -hmm. doctor was shocked, it was just because the person was open mm -hmm. to the idea that that really was possible, which yes. is where our egos can teach us, no, it isn't. Yes. I mean, it's phenomenal. Yes. Healing's a state of mind. It's not, uh, you know, in the end, even the process of healing is, is a nice metaphor, but it's a state, it's just accepting what is, in yeah. the sense of um, just starting to, to see that you have dominion over the images and the symbols in your life and that they don't have dominion over you. I know. And that's really what we're, It's hard about. for us to believe that, I gather. I mean, mm -hmm. because we don't. I mean, we're, we're, we're working at releasing. Yes. But when, when we, f well, even all the New Age stuff about healing and the path and what you need and what mm -hmm. color you wear and what you have to, how you have to sit. Yes. That's still a detour. Yes, it's another version. I saw it's the more New Age version of some of the old rituals <laughs> and doctrines in, yeah. in, in a, a new form. But, but it's extremely simple when we start to just see that 
that we are not in charge and that it's the Holy Spirit's task to do it and all we have to have is the willingness. Yeah. And it's only when we think that there's something to step in and to do that we get back into the linearity and, yeah. and that's where the struggle yeah. seems to be. We're, we so. get into the past, we get into the future, but we're just not, we're not just detached. We're, we're not in a moment yeah. of peace. And the moment remains. Yeah, it's always there. Yes. That's the real world. That's yes. what I want our friends to understand today, that yes. that's what we have, that's what we are. That's yes. been our gift. Yes. And it's shared. Yes. It's a completely shared experience. There's no one excluded. Yeah. I would like to read a lesson from A Course in Miracles. This is Lesson 50. I am sustained by the love of God. Here is the answer to every problem that will confront you, today, tomorrow, and throughout time. In this world, you believe you are sustained by everything but God. Your faith is placed in the most trivial and insane symbols. Pills, money, protective clothing, influence, prestige, being liked, knowing the right people, and an endless list of forms of nothingness that you endow with magical powers. That's quite a list, David. And we're all familiar with that list and how it torments us and teases us and it tells us that this is how we can be somebody. Yes. I want you to help me with what we discussed before the show about creating and manifesting. I had a friend call the other day said, Penelope, I don't like the fact that I have to take responsibility for what I'm manifesting. I don't like it. And can, and you just made it so beautifully clear to me. I want you to help my friends with it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it really starts to get simpler and simpler as you go into it. Uh, what we learn from the Course, uh, and I have such gratitude for an awakened mind because it's like it saves time yeah. to learn from the Master. So yes. we have the Master Psychologist Jesus teaching us, and he basically is saying that, that creation is, is of God and like God. That God created Christ, so Christ is an idea in the mind of God, and then Jesus makes many references to s creations with a small c and says that, that we have creations, so that Christ has creations as well. It's like, it just, it's an hmm. extension. An extension. Now, that's all at a pure abstract level, we could say, or I, w I tend to use the word levellessness because <laughs> whenever we're speaking of levels, <laughs> yeah. God and heaven are not involved. What is? is pure abstraction and it's, it's, we could say it's eternal, it's changeless, it's um, infinite. We've used some of those words in the yeah. previous program, perfection. Yeah. And so when we talk about making or manifesting, we are speaking at the level of perception. And the, the, that is where a lot of error comes in when people will say things like, I'm, I'm creating, I created this, illu this um, illusion, I created this cancer, I I'm created these, these circumstances in my life, and so forth. And shame on me. And shame on me. <laughs> and, and basically, it's, it's using that word create, it's using that, that power that comes from the power to create, when actually all perceptions are projections of the ego. And mm. so we could say that all things that seem to occur in the world and all of the world in history are, are projections and are manifestations. So, But that's of the ego. It's of the ego. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it gets back to that core thing about, you know, people say, the world is so vast. I mean, <laughs> we're looking at, you know, <laughs> galaxies and solar systems and black holes and, and, and oceans and mountains and so forth, you know. Bombs. It's like if God <laughs> didn't create that, then exactly where did it come from? And I say, well, it, it's just a testimony to the, how powerful the mind is, that to believe in the impossible, to believe in, the, in separation, which is what the ego is, yeah. that's really where the, the so-called Big Bang seemed to occur, was yeah. to try to believe in the impossible or to give power to something that is meaningless. And so we have a vast fragmented cosmos. It's literally the scattering of stars and, yeah. and many different realms is kind of a symbol of how powerful this mind is that we're talking about. So but we're not going to lose track of the fact that God did not create time space. God did not create this physical universe mm -hmm. because it's, it's temporary. It's finite. Yeah. Even the physicists, the quantum physicists, you know, whether it seems to be expanding or 
they say it may start contracting. You, you can see the duality yeah. that's involved in all of that. And God is not a God of duality. God mm -hmm. is a God of pure spirit and oneness. Yeah. So if we bring it down to the practical level, every time that you ch attempt to take responsibility for specific circumstances, <laughs> you know, it's playing right into the hand of the ego. Oh. And there's a lot of guilt yeah. involved in that. And so it's more just an opportunity to call on the miracle and to really say, I want another way of looking at this. Yeah. Don't have to analyze it. Don't have to look judge back it. into the past and judge it and figure it out from a linear perspective. It's yeah. just surrender the perspective. Because it doesn't exist. Because it doesn't exist. And now that's such a big one for us who love mm -hmm. guilt, who love to go and go to church and what, what's the word when you go and you're, you renunciate your whatever it is. And be absolved. Be absolved and, and all mm -hmm. of that. We, do, we like to do that. But, but we do that because we do feel guilty. We feel we've created all kinds of awful things and we haven't. Yes. And I think our friends need to hear that. That's very inspiring. Well, we're, we're always teaching ourselves and, and the key metaphysics of it is that the guilt comes from believing in the belief in separation. The belief that you actually could separate from a loving God mm -hmm. would be guilt inducing. Yeah. But what the ego tries to do in its sneaky way is to project the source of the guilt away and outside from the, of the mind. I'm guilty because I didn't pay back the money that I owed. I'm guilty because I said some harsh words. I'm guilty because I haven't lived up to my parents' expectations. You can see that what the ego wants is it wants us to find the source of the guilt in the world. And it says, find the source of the absolution. You know, do enough penance. Yeah, um, right, enough penance. Or enough, do your Course in Miracles lessons just perfect, yeah. you know. And it would rather us obsess about the form, hoping that we can find the solution in form, and it's a game. It's because who in this world has not tried to live the perfect life? Perfection is our inheritance, but forgiveness is necessary first. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is going within the mind and examining the, the belief systems that we live by. Mm -hmm. okay. what, the level of behavior or, or is just the level, that's the level of outcomes, you know. Yeah. Jesus really clarifies that in the text when he says, what you do comes from what you think. Yeah. So all of our behavior modification, all of our things to become, to look younger, to be more beautiful, to be more muscular, to <laughs> all of our vitamins and pills and things that he was just mentioning, all this effort is an effort to, to improve the self or to maintain the self at the level of behavior. And what he's saying is that those are just effects. You need to change your thinking. Yeah. Well, when we first start to do this, we find out it's a lot easier to change our behavior <laughs> even than it is to change our thinking. That these thi thoughts That's are true. very deeply rooted. And when you start to go into the metaphysics a little deeper, you find that your thoughts come from your underlying assumptions, your beliefs about the nature of the world, mm -hmm. of yourself, and reality. So. You, you know, that's what my life has been, is literally a life of questioning. You know, 10 years of college, instead of just accepting what the professors would say, I would notice that the different disciplines were like talking ag about each other, against each other. There was a lot of debate, really? there was a lot of arguing, yeah. but there wasn't a lot of peace and serenity. So I just thought, well, I'm going to use these years to ask questions, ask questions. To, to go deeper. The physical scientists were looking at a different world than the psychologists, and the psychologists were looking at a different world than the sociologists. And I began to say, <laughs> yeah. what's the truth? I'm getting confused. Yeah, what's, yeah there's got to be something that's <laughs> beneath all of these assumptions. Simpler. Much simpler. Yeah. If there is such a thing as truth, it has to be extremely simple, and it should be an aha. It should be <laughs> something like a child coming upon something with wonderment, yeah. not something that's this a very difficult strain How about easy? struggle. Easy. Easy. It should uh -huh. be easy, natural. Yeah, natural. And it doesn't seem that way. I mean, the years of questioning where the voices of the world are saying, you know, fit in, you know, find your niche, make yeah. a life, make an image of yourself, yeah. have something to plant your, you know, your roots in. Yeah. To continue and follow that small still voice has been the real taken the real willingness because the little voice would always say, step back and see the big picture. You know, it, this isn't about becoming something in the world or attaining something in the world. This is about seeing the big picture. Yeah. And it takes a lot of faith to keep coming inward. 
when you're going through all the feelings, yeah. the the um, upsets, the emotions, they're yeah. heavy at times. Yeah. They're very intense. And instead of trying to distract away with entertainment and drugs and so on and so forth, it takes a lot of willingness to, to go through Courage. the experience yeah. and then to trust that there's something beneath it. Yeah. And that's pretty much what my yeah. life has been about. Yeah. And we don't think there's something beneath it until we do dare jump. Yes. And then we find yes. out we live through it. Sure. And it, everything's all right. It's exactly what we were talking about in the first show. And that why would you go for God or go for something unless you had an experience that lets you know that it was real? Yeah. And um, when people talk about pain and suffering and victimization and the things that are on the news and that are so prevalent seemingly in this world, it's like when I started to just say, all right, Jesus, I'm just going to give my life over to you. I don't know where this is going, but I'm going to go for it. I'm yeah. going to plant all my faith in this thing. Miraculous things started to happen. You know, the yeah. people I met, yeah. the, the gathering, the intimate talks like yeah. we're having yeah. to go from town to town, place to place, and have these kind of experiences as if you've known these people your whole I, life. Yeah, I know. It, Isn't it it's something? It's very extraordinary. It's yeah. very much different than anything I'd ever experienced. Yeah. And and then that be started to become my normal, my natural experience. Instead of the old, which was kind of like a glimpse or a peep here or there, you know, you, when you really start to surrender into it, it starts to just expand and yeah. touch all aspects of your yeah. perception. Yeah. yeah. And that's the excitement. Yeah, and you show up yes. and you're in the moment. Yes. And you just surrender. Yes. There's really nothing to do. In There's other words, nothing to do. I, with all the college, you know, planning out talks and this and that, you show up, you walk, the times I'm walking to, a, to a, a bookstore or to the pulpit of a church or to a living room or whatever, don't have a clue about what's going to be said, sometimes not even an idea of a topic, and then the presence of God orchestrates the gathering. That's right. This isn't about um, persons that are supposed to be no more than others coming. This is about joining together in an intention yeah. and letting the voice for God speak that's among right. us. Yes. And where two or more are gathered, That's he right. is there. And, and it works. It, I mean, there's so much energy going on here yes, today. It's so yes, exciting. Yes. And I knew from the from from the week that where I was really very lost that I was so looking forward to joining my mind with your mind, yes. David, and yes. and sharing and extending and feeling happy and joyous and being very awake. Yes. I mean, it's it's just it's a beautiful experience yes. and it's just so simple. Yes. And it's so vast, and the experiences yeah. get more intense and more wonderful, and it's like Jesus says, you can barely keep your feet on the ground. I mean, and, and this is in a, a wonderful way. It's not induced by sp drugs or by, you know, I got the promotion, I got the cotton candy I wanted. You know, the ego tries to lure us into to thinking that our happiness can be found in getting outcomes yeah. that we want, mm -hmm. but that self that that once those outcomes is deceived. That's right. And that's why it's, it's like the hamster running around. The, the more we chase, the more we run, the more the, we seem to be entwined in it. It takes, it takes more effort to yeah. bring about those little transitory highs yeah. and to battle against those lows, so to speak. Yeah. And what this is, is just a surrender that, that I am sustained by the love of God, that, that by aligning my mind with God, I will be intensely happy. Yeah. And it's that simple. Yeah. The things that stand in the way of it is the ego's voice, which is screeching, <laughs> stop. <laughs> the ego, no fool to itself, you know, is, wants to preserve itself. Of course. And so it's fighting for its life. Fighting for its <laughs> life, its so-called life, with everything that it's got, and quite intensely. When we have self-critical thoughts, when we put ourselves down, the ego is like a spider that sits back at the edge of the web and loves and, it. And loves it. Yeah. When we start to have these loving, joyful experiences, it goes into action. I mean, it moves forward in the web, <laughs> and it will pull out everything, <laughs> including the kitchen sink, to stop us from remembering how happy we're supposed to be all the time, because yeah. it's natural. Yeah. And so, you know, the more you go into it, though, you see that, you know, as they say in Star Trek, resistance is futile. Yeah. And you might as well just give way to love, because love is the will of There's God. There's nothing to feel guilty about, is there? There is not. There's nothing. T talk to me about that for a moment. There's nothing to feel guilty about. And I say that from myself, who works with guilt a lot, and my friends, and we all want to hear, but why not? Mm. Well, it's, the ego wants us to buy the game that there are certain things that um, there's a justifiable guilt for. It just wants to break guilt up into 
as it does with everything, duality. There's good yeah. guilt and there's bad guilt. <laughs> you know, there's, there's justifiable <laughs> guilt, like, whoa, you should feel guilty about that. And, well, you can let that one go. That's in the lesser camp, you know. <laughs> but but well, you see how that just per perpetuates and holds on to that belief in guilt. Yeah. When we, we are coming to a an awareness that forgiveness, the real world is an awareness that that we haven't done anything wrong. That our guilt came from a misperception of believing in the ego. Yeah. It's kind of like a little child who, you know, has been told, don't go and have any cookies. You know, you leave that cookie jar alone and then looks around when mom's not yep. looking and reaches in and then <gasps> seems to get caught as if I've done something terribly wrong. Well, that's how the, the deceived mind feels that believes it is separated from God. Yeah. The ego has said, you have fallen from grace, you've separated from God, and you, you've got a good reason to feel guilty. You've done something terrible. And to think that you can just pull yourself away from God and think that God's just going to sit back and allow that yeah. is, is not reasonable. So the ego is really trying to convince us that guilt is real. What Jesus does is he even uses the metaphor from the Bible where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where it's like in, in the Bible, it's like the tree was there and God said, don't eat that fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Adam and Eve, they, they go ahead, they, they eat from that forbidden tree. Yeah. What Jesus says in the Chorus is he says that, that God could never put you in a position like that. Would a loving father put his child in a position where oh my something goodness, terrible what a great could happen? Point. That God would never put his child, his creation, in that position. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, when you start to take a look at that, then... Oh, I feel better. <laughs> that's, that's even a release of like an ontological guilt. Yeah. Of, of, of guilt that I've done something in my mind very terrible. When, when you really start to look at how impossible and incredible separation really is. Yeah. And they kept telling me, I kept hearing, God is all loving and all knowing and all powerful. Yeah. Well, when I would have experiences in this world, like my father, my grandfather being diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. then I had to start to reconcile it. Well, if God's all knowing and all loving and all powerful, and my father, my grandfather is suffering with cancer, what's what's going on here? Yeah. And if God has anything to do with with, this, with the suffering that's going on, seemingly with what I'm perceiving with my grandfather, then why would I want to have anything to do with God? Oh. Why would I want to spend eternity with God? Why would I want to have dinner with God, even, <laughs> if yeah. God has something to do with my grandfather's suffering? So where it comes around full circle is, ah, David, your perception is distorted. You see through a darkened glass. You're, yeah. you're misperceiving. Your mind needs correction. I see. And, and the more you go in deeper into that correction, you start to realize you don't have to reconcile the perceptual world with God. With God. That's where the struggle comes yeah. in. Yeah. The struggle comes in with trying to figure out, you know, the age-old question, where did, where did God go wrong? <laughs> if he created the Garden of Eden, he must have had a fatal flaw in that design. <laughs> but no, you know, what if God is purely abstract and this is simply an awakening to remember that abstraction? To remember that. Yes. So the pain we put ourselves through is from our minds looking in the wrong direction. It's just a misperception. It's a misperception. Yes. And we're not talking about stuffing feelings here because a lot of no. times people will, will say, oh yeah, just walk around, la la la, all is God, all is love, and get some flowers and this and that. You know, we're, we're talking about letting go of a belief system. And what that means is thoroughly, even meticulously, when scraps of fear coming up, of, of taking a look and then choosing again and releasing. So you're like allowing the light to shine in the dark caverns of yeah. the mind. Yeah. And that's very different than repressing feelings. When the feelings come up, you have a choice. You can try to distract away from them, yeah. which this world has plenty of distractions they if sure you want to follow the ego's absolutely. You know, path. Or you can, can go within and with a willingness and desire to go beyond those feelings and, and be free of them, you can release them. Yeah. How does it happen? The basic metaphysics. Feelings come from thoughts. Attack thoughts produce thoughts of upset, fear, pain, anger, you know, yeah. all those kind of things. Thoughts of God and produce love, joy. Release the attack thoughts, you know. That's, what, that's why we have to go into releasing the thoughts. Yeah. It's not a matter of, you don't get brownie points in heaven for feeling the feelings. 
that's longer. That's I mean, a, yeah. a lot, one path in the, this thing is like feel the feelings. I hear that all the time. I know, you don't get you? To feel the feelings. Yeah. Get out of your head. Feel the feelings. <laughs> well, you can just feel the pain and upset as long as you want, but you know, where's the happiness in feeling pain? Do you get points for five minutes, 10, 15, 20? It's a matter of releasing. Releasing. The only value that allowing those feelings into awareness has is that you can see by contrast that you don't like how you feel. You can make that judgment yeah. and then you can surrender and release the thoughts and the interpretations that are producing the, the feelings. feelings. Very good. So it's really quite simple. You, now we've just eliminated a lot more of the seeming journeys of the world yeah. because these are all ego distortions that, that try to yeah. keep, keep perpetuate itself. Yeah, as we get together we try so hard to keep ourselves awake and to learn and be happy and be in the moment. I yeah. mean that's all we can do is yeah. work on us yes. and work and then hence we work all of us together but everything that we see if we do not see the Son of God in another yeah. it's from an, illus uh, an illusion of ours. Yes. It's a fear yes. thought. Yes. If I, I try and make it that simple. I yes. mean, I try and keep that mind, let my brothers and my sisters be my teachers. Yes. It's very simple because it's just thoughts. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like two thought systems, one of love, one of fear. That one of fear has to be unveiled because as, as long as it's believed in or attractive in any way, then it just perpetuates yeah. and we have the illusion of suffering. When that is released, then the joy can come in. Yeah. So it's when people talk about the, these artificial distinctions like the head and the heart and the intellectual versus the you know spiritual it's really a matter of of cognition in the sense that you you cognition is thinking and and when you have a desire to release attack thoughts you will be extremely happy because only the the attack yeah. thoughts the grievances produce the upsetting emotions the upsetting emotions mm -hmm. It's very simple. It's and, very basic. And you, it's like touching a stove and burning yourself. After a while, you begin to catch on to how to find peace. Yes. And we were talking before about initially on your journey, the Holy Spirit uses the contrast. Mm. You have a yeah. seemingly a very painful experience and an intensely joyful one, and you, you say, hmm, I want this one. When you really start to surrender to the Holy Spirit, though, the Holy Spirit wants happy learners. In other words, <laughs> the contrast is, an, is only necessary at the beginning yeah. because the more you start to withdraw from the ego and have happier and happier experiences, we learn better from attraction than repulsion. That's true. And negativity, it's kind of like the thing of the parent telling the child, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, teach, do only that. Live it, be an example, and what you your state of mind will be much more of an example for your children and those that surround you than your actions, because children can see right past those actions. Yeah. You know. So in the, in the, if you could look at the growth process, it gets to be gentler. Yes. It gets to be gentler, because we can see a lot of people, sometimes you have to hit a major rock bottom to start the process. Yes. There's a, and it's necessary. I mean, yes. we're thick. I mean, we, we got to wake up. Yes. Those are the contrasts. Those are and the they big contrasts. Big contrasts. But, but my message really is that you can be a happy learner. And uh, in talking with that. people, it's like, wouldn't you rather learn lessons of joy than lessons of pain? See, the mind, there's only two lessons. It seems like there's multiple lessons we go through. Yeah. The wrong mind, the ego, is a lesson. And the right mind, the Holy Spirit, is a lesson. The mind is trying to teach itself that it's an ego, is trying to teach itself an impossible lesson. Okay. So it goes on and on and on, on, and on in on time on. until it, it realizes that it would rather be happy than right. That's the key thing because as long as the self-concept is valued, then people have all these debates That's and right. I'm right and yep. you're not yep. and, and these walls come up and, yeah. and defenses and this and that when we are one. It's better to be happy than to be right. Yes. Yeah, I like that. I can remember that from the Course. Yes. Whew. Well, you are so energetic and the energy that we put together is this two and three gathered together. We were talking about uh, sort of a new uh, a new form of church where there's no form, yes. where it's just simply two people, yes. two three people getting together, yes. and well, I, sharing. I, I was raised in a Christian church, and, and even then the idea was the church isn't the building, and the church really isn't in the people. The church is a is the presence of God. Yeah, the church is like an altar in our mind, yes. and and that altar we really need to to keep it clear and keep it open for the light to radiate through yeah. that. Because yeah. when we put idols on that altar, then all we're saying is we want to try to go against God's will. Yeah. 
but God's will for us is to be happy. So, yeah. you know, it yeah. comes back to the real basics of, yeah. of giving ourselves permission to be happy. Yeah, and the altar is within us everywhere, every place we go. Yes. I mean, we have everything that we need. Yes. That's a wonderful thing to remember in yes. the last couple of minutes that our friends know. Every answer of everything that they need, they're totally taken care of, nurtured, loved, yes. fed. Everything is there. When it isn't, it's the ego, it's our own blocks that stand in the way of receiving everything that we really are. Yes. We have everything. We're, yes. We have abundance, we have health, we're perfect. Yes, and we can associate all those things with the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of heaven is within, the kingdom of heaven is not of this world. Yeah. So we have to really trust and have faith that our perception is being retranslated and healed. and just go with the joy. I mean, that's what it means to be a happy learner, to yeah. just the lessons get happier and happier and happier yeah. because they're from God. Yeah. The Course has really made such a big difference, too, in so many people's lives. It does seem to be an amazing wake-up call for so many people. It's yes. just, it's powerful. Yes. It's channeled. It's the truth. It's like a, a so-called Western version of, of the perennial wisdom. In other words, this wisdom, I think, of Ramana Maharshi and the Eastern saints that have talked about the Maya, the illusion, duality. Yeah. This is, you know, this is the perennial wisdom. There's nothing new about yeah. any of this. But, I know. but said in a way, using Christian terms, psychological terms, you know, educational terms, it speaks to the Western mind. And, and we needed that. It's great. I'm grateful <laughs> that we got it. Thank you, David. You're very welcome.